When will this pandemic be over? How many times have you mumbled that to yourselves? Now we're asking health experts what signs we should actually be looking for. We're starting to see proof that vaccines are working, buried in the numbers we recite here each night. One person making one choice that was 100% preventable. Someone made the wrong choice, and this family hopes it'll help you make the right one. And we tackle the pronunciation of a town in the metro area, and it is not Arvada. I'm Steve Steger, in for Kyle Clark. This is Next. Take a tour around Colorado today, and you will see different views of the pandemic. In some counties, leaders are saying the virus has already been beaten. In others, doctors urge that we still need to be cautious. So how will we know when the pandemic is over? Our Mark Salinger asked that question. How do we know when the pandemic is over? I mean, it's not over yet, right? I would definitely say the pandemic is not over yet. If there's anyone who would know the answer, it's Dr. Michelle Barrett. She's the senior medical director of infection prevention at UC Health. This changes so frequently that I'm even hesitant to give predictions. There's no single metric that will determine when the pandemic is over. But there are a lot of factors that will allow doctors and health officials to safely say we're in a good place and can relax restrictions. Reaching herd immunity with a high percentage of people vaccinated is top of mind right now. Somewhere between 70, 80 percent is probably, I think, the point at which we will feel comfortable that enough people are protected that it's not going to spread. So far, more than 40 percent of adults in the state have received at least one dose of the vaccine and a quarter are fully vaccinated. I, I think one of the most important things to look at right now is hospital admissions, really looking at the severity of the cases. The metrics we've relied on to gauge how things are going are changing with this fourth wave. The vast majority of people above the age of 70 and in vulnerable categories are now vaccinated. Bob McDonald is the director of the Denver Department of Public Health. The most vulnerable, uh, while there still are some infections there, it's, it's not like we were seeing in the beginning. Um, it is a younger group now. Counties in the Denver metro area plan to lose all restrictions and enter level clear as early as mid-May. Health departments will add more restrictions if hospitalizations begin to rise again. That's probably the, the single most important metric is looking at those hospitalization rates and who is it uh, that's going to the hospital. So is the pandemic over? The short answer is no, but we're getting a better idea of what to look for to find out if it is over when that day comes. Now we talk about those changing metrics and Steve, one example of that right now is that testing is way down, which is pushing the positivity rate up. Right now they aren't too worried about it. So Mark, you've got some places where you have restaurant restrictions, some places with mask mandates, and then other places that don't. So how do people know what to do uh, to stay safe. Yeah, you can drive just a couple of miles and be in the county with different restrictions. So what it all comes down to right now and that what health officials are pushing is personal responsibility. Do what feels safe to you, wear your mask, continue to wash your hands, get vaccinated when you can, and that'll get us through this. Mark Salinger, live from the Salinger Estate. Mark, thank you so much. Some updated numbers out this afternoon from the state health department show more than a quarter of Coloradans are now fully vaccinated. On top of that, nearly 15% are partially vaccinated. So more than 40% of the state's population now has some protection from the worst effects of COVID-19. However, our daily positivity rate, as Mark said, is trending in the wrong direction. Yesterday, the daily rate moved further above the benchmark of 5% to 7.12. Now the weekly average has also bumped up it's at 5.75%. The numbers are also concerning when we look at hospitalizations. We're now at 510 patients in the hospital. Hospital numbers haven't been that high since the beginning of February. Now, vaccinations appear to be keeping older Coloradans out of the hospital, as Mark mentioned, which is making this fourth wave of the virus a bit more manageable in our state. State data analyzed by SCL Health found that 65% of new COVID cases last week were reported in people under the age of 40. 92% of those cases were people under the age of 60. Now remember, most of our deaths and hospitalizations were in people 70 and over, considered to be at a higher risk. SCL couldn't give us specific age data on people who've been admitted to the hospital with COVID. They could only say anecdotally that most patients hospitalized lately tend to be younger.
it's typically a younger population right now that's being hospitalized. Um, but in general, they tend to do a lot better, um, shorter lengths of stay, less need for the intensive care unit. Uh, patients are coming in, they are sick, uh, but they are being discharged relatively quickly and we're optimistic with that. Now, Dr. Vallon also told us the most patients over the age of 60, he's seen it hospitalized. They're patients who haven't been vaccinated yet. The owner of a vaccine clinic shut down by the state is speaking publicly for the first time. Dr. MoMA Health and Wellness was told to stop administering the vaccine after the state discovered issues with the clinic, including substandard vaccine storage. Someone speaking on behalf of the facility says that they met all the requirements to be a vaccine provider. She says no one from the state conducted an on-site compliance visit before it started administering doses. CDPHE tells us that rarely occurs prior to enrollment with more than 1300 approved providers. After a rather chaotic press conference, Sylvie Nash MoMA spoke briefly to reporters. Uh, we are working with the state and every agent involved to make sure that we rectify all the allegations and concerns that have been raised. So we are now the facility typically offers services like Botox and tattoo removal. The Dr. MoMA clinic says that they have an approved storage unit for the vaccine. Governor Polis today signed two bills into law that deal with the state safe storage of guns. One requires firearms to be securely stored when not under the control of a gun owner if a juvenile or prohibited person might be able to access them. The other is named after Denver shooting victim Isabella Thales. It requires gun owners to report to law enforcement when a gun is lost or stolen. Thales was shot and killed last summer. Police say the gun used in that shooting was stolen from a DPD officer. The Isabella Joy Thales Act gives a gun owner five days to report to law enforcement when their gun is lost or stolen. Thank you so much for your continued generous support of your Word of Thanks microgiving campaigns while I was away. Last week, you raised more than $20,000 for the Sava Center in Northern Colorado, helping survivors of sexual violence and working with high schoolers to prevent sexual violence in the future. It means that your Word of Thanks campaigns have now raised more than $3.6 million for Colorado's small to mid-sized nonprofits since last June. I'll be back on Wednesday with an idea of how together we can help nonprofits in each of Colorado's counties. It is an effort that was custom made just for next viewers.
Tomorrow is 420, Colorado's unofficial cannabis holiday. To inspire people to make good decisions, some grieving families are sharing stories about the impact of drugged driving. They include the parents of 28-year-old Ethan Small. He died in January of 2019 after dropping someone off at the Auraria RTD station. Ethan was all about making a difference and change. I want people to know that they do have a choice. Ethan had just turned 28 years old. When you become a parent, each child has an impact on you in many ways. And that's through his life and also now through, unfortunately, his death. Ethan was doing some lift driving on the side. He had a few rides that morning, dropped off a passenger right down the street here at the light rail station. He was then proceeding through the intersection on a green light. He was struck by a driver that ran a red light. And was traveling at over 90 miles an hour. Severely intoxicated, alcohol, THC, cocaine, and benzoids in his system. Ethan's injuries were so severe that there was no way he could survive, and he passed away that night. One person making one choice that was 100% preventable. Make the right choice to never drive impaired, ever. And the other thing to understand when you're behind the wheel is that the vehicle is now a weapon, can be a weapon. You as the driver potentially have killed, or in this case did kill someone. It's not the car. You did it. I worry about that. What is the impact of a sign or some words on a sign? Ethan was a living human being. He was a breathing human being. He wasn't just some person in words on a page for a news story or for a sign. He was a human being and he's gone forever. I hope it makes a difference. Ethan Small's story through the lens of photojournalist Chris Hansen. According to Colorado State Patrol data, between 2019 and 2020, arrests increased 90% for drivers impaired by both cannabis and alcohol. A winter weather advisory has been posted for heavy snow as a fast moving but intense storm system brings in not only cold air, but three to six inches of snow tonight. Our high today at 42, that's about 20 degrees colder than average. This system will dive south overnight with the best chance for accumulating snow between now and 6 a.m. Winter weather and travel advisories cover the mountains, foothills and Denver. That winter weather advisory out through three o'clock in the morning for three to six inches of snow. We go to bed with snow falling and it could be heavy at times, but we're going to wake up to sunshine as this fast moving storm is out of here that quickly. Winter weather advisory, three to six inches of snow and a potential record low in the lower teens tonight. Sunshine, quick warming trend tomorrow, but our high only 40. Cold night tomorrow night, maybe a stray snow shower on Wednesday, and then the real warming trend gets going back to 70s late in the weekend. Corey Reppenhagen is on the weather beat. Covered with winter, yearning for true spring to come, grateful above all. That was Corey Reppenhagen on the weather beat. Farms inside shipping containers are growing hundreds of pounds of food every week in Colorado and a parenting innovation for the 21st century. Next.
like that jam. A three-year-old Colorado company has an ambitious goal to bring food security, safety, and sustainability to communities in need around the world. Based in Sedalia, Farm Box Foods builds vertical hydroponic farms inside shipping containers. Centura Health is among its growing list of customers. So this lettuce is all going to uh, various Centura hospitals um, down here in the South Denver uh, metro regions. When people think of farms, they don't think of, you know, agriculture like this. My name is Jake Savageau. I'm the COO of Farmbox Foods. We want to create a product that can be deployed anywhere in the world, can run off grid and can feed communities. The VHF is the vertical hydroponic farm, and that's the farm that we're standing in. The water gets fed into a tube system and the water trickles down and goes back into the tank. So there's a, a software that we use called Agrotech that monitors the temperature, the humidity, the lights. These can de be deployed anywhere, and they grow 365, you know, all day, every day. You know, we can put a box behind a restaurant and have lettuces cut and washed and put on the plate the next day. Uh, well, I'm Corian. I, uh, I operate the grow space with uh, Edible Beets, um, and you know we're a we're a local restaurant group. We are looking at um, lettuces and herbs, leafy greens. They drip water with uh, enhanced nutrients mixed into the water, specifically built for those vegetables. It's going to be a better quality because it's not traveling. You know, it's it's not ripening in a truck coming from Mexico. I'd say the applications are are absolutely unlimited. My name is Rusty Walker. I'm the proud CEO of Farmbox Foods. One big area that, that we're really focusing on is the urban areas uh, throughout the United States where they don't have a lot of land to grow. We're not competing with traditional farming. We're actually a complement. Farmbox Foods has another kind of container farm, their gourmet mushroom farm. It's known as GMF, currently grows eight or nine different varieties. Along with Centura, other customers in Colorado include Vitamin Cottage Natural Food Markets and the Sea Lazy U Ranch in Granby. For tonight's What Do You Say? We don't have to venture out too far. Our viewer Heather wants help pronouncing the name of a city right here in the metro area. No, it's not Arvada. It starts with an E. It's there at the bottom of your screen. And Heather says that she and her husband always fight over the right way to pronounce this. So for this, we reached out to the city's historical society to ask, what do you say? Inglewood, long E. It's not Anglewood, it's not Anglewood, it's Inglewood. The father of our city, a fellow named Thomas Skerritt, um, had spent some time in Inglewood, Illinois on his way out here for the gold rush. And uh, and he just kind of liked that name. And at the point when they we incorporated in 1903, Inglewood was known, uh, was described as five bars, two brothels, and a grocery store. Yeah, the Inglewood was the Sin City of Colorado. And if that doesn't impress you, here's something more family friendly. The guy who helped build the first machine to make Cheerios. He's from Inglewood. All right, where should we go next? Send us your suggestions by email or by social media. The most Colorado thing we saw today and your feedback next.
you see him rolling, but we're not Hayden. Is that how you do it? Uh, because he's the most Colorado thing we saw today. You see, the key to fatherhood is learning to work smarter, not harder. Tammy spotted this dad in Central Park the other day. He's pushing his baby in a stroller while riding one of those one wheelie things. So baby's uh, baby gets a little bit of fresh air, the wind in its hair. Dad gets a chore done without really having to exert any energy. It's kind of fun, although that would require some coordination. It's a win win. If you see something that's so Colorado you want to share it with us, do it. Email next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext on Twitter. Bill and Kathy write in tonight. Kyle is not on the show because all capital letters because question mark. So Kyle enjoying some time off. In the meantime, you're stuck with me, Marshall, Anusha and Jeremy, and I hope that's OK. We'll see you next time. Thank you.